Cheval waves to the masses who burst into music and cheering. Trumpets tooting and drums banging in flutes, curling elongated notes. It moves me to clap along. People pushing, dancing and clapping, jostling me toward the center of the ruckus. The crowd is happy. They're free and they belong. Belong together. I'm not purely French, but no one knows. And Cheval wouldn't mind. I'm not a nippy. I glance back to the stage for another view of the new king, but he is gone, no longer standing upon the steps. It was only a short time he stood there, but that is a memory that will stay with me longer than the grime stains on my shirt. The sweet scent of baked bakeries whisks through the air, through the air and up my nose. The smell is so, so good. I spin around in the scent's direction, accidentally smacking my hand across the man's face. Put on, I say, and tip dad's cap. But the man mumbles under his shuffling mustache, reminding me of dad's stash, trim and sharp. But for now, the very scent takes precedence. The waving arms, flapping banners, and women's hats and hair block my view. So I raise my nose and let it lead me along the path of hot berries and pastry. I push through the crowd, pressing between backsides when the occasion calls for it. Suddenly, I'm brought to a halt. Stone still as the big statue of Cheval Race's grandfather behind me. As the stall sign blazes at the end of the square, drawn in very red dripping letters, Gregory's Berries. I dig my hands into my pockets and hope for coins, but there's just dirt. If Benny paid more, these pockets would tingle with coin enough to buy some desserts. Maybe Gregory will be up for, about, for bargaining. I blunder through the crowd and stroll on up. The stall is no bigger than a wagon, just enough room for the ovens at the back and the trays at the front and the red and white striped tent roof. At the front, berry pastries sit on steaming hot tray, sparkling with sugar. The berry's aroma waters my mouth, teasing my tongue. Would Monso Gregory care if I borrowed just one? That would be a noble bargain. A character sporting a beard that could house a sparrow's nest emerges from the crowd in big black shiny boots with clinking spurs. He approaches the counter. Grigory, the pastry man, thinning black hair and a little chubby bellied in his white apron, rubs a greasy stubble on his face and fills his eyes, flits his eyes at the man with the boots. Buy two, get one free, he says in a strict Russian accent. A Russian? They're not likely to let you borrow anything. But those berries demand I try. Shiny Boots nods, his beard shakes, and Gregory throws three paces in a brown paper bag and tosses them to him. I tap my fingers on my pants and bide my time. If only Gregory would get distracted. A lady clad in a yellow dress, shading her face with an elaborate yellow hat and a twirling yellow umbrella waltzes through the crowd. Men bend their necks like ibis, near the breaking point to peek a lecturous glance at their swaying backside. Some fellows nearly fall in amongst the apples. Each one effectively whacked by the lady's swaying umbrella as she passes them until she presents herself at the stall. This could be the perfect di diversion. She shifts her wide brimmed hat so it takes on an elegant tilt, revealing spiraling chocolate brown hair, the kind of chocolate that melts in your mouth. The girl parts her hair from her eyes with a sensuous swipe of the hand, and a fresh olive skin beholds the glory of the sun gathering all the attention she will ever need from this world. The girl stinks of bourgeois, but is perfect for my plans. She folds her umbrella with a gentle shake. Gregory glances at her and his eyes are not at all dull like they were for the bearded gentleman. They widen a little. He turns his back and spits in his hands, slicks them through the remains of his oily hair. Then swaggers over in a confident gait and leans up against the counter, smiling like a alley cat stalking a hoopoe. This is the time I was biting upon. I reach over the counter and touch a pastry. Grains of sugar rolling under my fingertips. One or two of these are going to taste amazing. Two, two would taste better. And as my hand rests upon a pastry, the girl shifts her gaze from under her hat and her eyes glance upon mine. The two dark irises contrasting against the bright whites like ripe almonds bathing in milk. An exciting spark as if 
invisible lightning travels between us. Is this what mom mentioned? Eyes connecting souls? The girl's eyes narrow as she pokes her umbrella right toward my lips. Thief, she says. The snitch. Gregory turns and spots me touching a pastry. His hands ball into fists, the mustard climbing to his nose. Mitts off, he shouts, raising one of his, those fists. He's going to fry me. In panic, my hand claws into the pastry. The hot pear is burning my fingers. Ah, I call and fling the treat and smack Gregory's face. He falls forward into his tray, hands sizzling as pastries explode into the air as if they blew up from a stick of dynamite, then rain down, pattering over the counter in the cobbled square. Gah! Gregory screams, ivory in pain or anger, turning his face red as if raspberry is about to erupt from his ears. With a rush turn, I shove away through the crowd, stray hands and hair slapping my face. Round in the corner of La Maison de Peinture, I collide into a painting set on a canvas, punching my hand right through the canvas and crashing down. Silly place to put a painting. Don't they know people use these sidewalks to run? People around me stare, jaws gaping as if they're waiting for falling pastries. I get up holding the painting, my hand still right through the middle of it. Upon turning the canvas, it's revealed I've punched right through the backside of a portly man in a bright red jacket conducting a symphony while he screams. I guess now it's a different kind of scream. Facing the crowd, I twiddle my fingers through the painting, through the chubby man's ass. It's now improved. Called new art. The crowd bring their eyes to a hateful burn. Get the art destroyer! An old lady hollers, waving a fist and a group of men charge. I whip my hand from the red rear end and toss the canvas. I run hard and far, taking one's legs to one's neck, squeezing through the crowd and charging down the street. My sandals slapping bumpy cobbles upon the road and lumpy stones upon the pavements. The hostile voice is heard in dwindling gradations. A sharp turn cuts me through a circular garden, then dashing by a fountain that is trickling with water, but it doesn't soothe me. A clutter of rainbow feathered roller birds burst out of my rampaging path, performing acrobatic loops. And then a busy boardwalk provides more obstacles, where a line of beggars sit against the wall with hats yearning for coins and an urging pulls me to toss the poor beggars a silver coin. And then comes the hurtful truth. There is no silver clinking in your own pockets. And their hats and their hands are left following in my wake. A horsetail flicks my face, the rider yelling, don't startle my stallion with a pointing finger. And I scoot past the bistro, knocking into the table of a young couple and abbot with one another. Shooting glasses of red Bordeaux heavenward. I check over my shoulder to see if the crowd is still vying for my blood, only to see the man whose white shirt is now red, and the woman whose blue dress has dark splotches, red wine dripping from her nose. Quite funny. And then I spear into her cart. <laughs> my aching stomach loses its wind and my forward thrust onto the cart sends Dad's cap flying from my head and falling on top of a woven blanket. The blanket covering something lumpy in the cart. Having Dad's cap off my head makes me feel lost of courage. I reach for the cap. Before grasping it, I'm yanked back from my trousers and spun around. It's the man with the glossy eyes. The stowaway, Devier says, squinting those examining eyes. You following me? Sort of, until the distraction of Cheval, but he doesn't need to know that. By the way, his gruff face is fuming. Hopefully he doesn't have a load of bayonets under that rug. I shake my head. Just after my cap, I stretch a hand for it, but he grabs my wrist, squeezing it tighter than Benny ever has. Nothing for you here, boy, he says, and shoves me into my chest. Run along. The cat first, but his brown eyes catch the sun and somehow indicate he's not to be messed with. I'll push his sandals along. His friend Balin appears from behind me. He gives a huge bear hug around my waist, pinning my arms and begins to carry me off. Meet you at the docks, Balin tells Devier. Devier throws me a stroke of the eye, I think, takes the cart with my cap and starts wheeling it down a narrow street. A foreman gendarme, probably his wagon is loaded with weapons. It would be safest to drop this, but... My cap is on the barrow, I tell Balin, as the strong man lugs me in the opposite direction. Buy another, Balin says. He doesn't understand. I open my mouth to explain, when from up the street comes a stampeding mess of feet 
my blood demanding painting crowd. The artist at the front of the pack hollers, that's the vandal. This day is sinking faster than Cheval's torn balloon. Many hate you, little chap, Balin says in my ear, then drops me. Best you flee before holes are torn in your body to match the one in your pants. Devier has disappeared and the mob closes in, so nowhere else to go. I dash down a random side street. My feet clap down the narrow path, echoing against the hugging grey stone walls. The footsteps of the crowd fade, and after a maze of tight blocks, the collective clatter of many angry feet dissipates and he's gone. See my lungs burn like Gregory's hands on his hot tray and force me to stop and catch my breath under a big Lebanon setter. The rough grey spark trunk forking into several branches of its spiral needle neck leaves. How can I find the detective now, I mutter, amidst gasping for breath. He'd be untraceable without following Devier. And Dad's cap is gone. This day feels like that balloon on the whole rooftop completely torn in half. Maybe the cap could at least be salvaged. Surely if I find Devier and just explain, he'll hand it over. He probably presumed I fancied his guns or whatever he had hidden under his blanket. I walk a street that heads downward, Rue de Lumière. The sliding slope seemingly mimicking my chances of ending this day safely, but presumably the street is leading to the ocean. Oak trees with their massive branches lie in a small park to the left, while down by the street corner a clock tower sits high on the red brick town hall. On the white building beside the town hall, a shutter bangs in the breeze on the top third floor, narrowly missing a clay pot on the sill. A tropical plant spreading from the pot and flaunting in its happy rosettes of richly got gloss, the green loosely arching leaves. A random rope dangles from over the roof top beside the window. Below, two small boys sit against the wall with dirt smudging their dark faces. They look at Bianian. Now that I think of it, that girl who tattled on me for going to the pastries looked iffy. That would explain her attitude. The boys sitting against the wall play an old Ipianian coolie flute. The tune, half out of key, and whispers down the streets. The council outlawed those coolies because they fire their rebellious epi spirit. But perhaps the real reason is because the way those boys are playing it sounds like a sick elephant with piles of mucus stuck up its trunk. A man barges out of a squeaky fly-wire door, stringy gorilla hair grown over his fat stomach, poking through the bottom of his shirt. He stands over the boys and they peer up like beaten dogs. You two get working already, he says. To smash that flaming flute. He points down the street, presumably toward their employment, and he lads jump up and scoot around the corner. Maybe it was their gaffer sending them on a swindle. If the aliens, after all. Don't get distracted, Lincoln. That's Cap, remember? Moving along soon has something interesting occurring. A superior head beyond a line of hardy cork oaks is a line of blue, the sea swishing over the sand. Just as the sound of the ocean crawling up and over the grains of gold begins to offer a calming melody, a raspy voice gives me a nasty shock. It's Devier. The voice grunts from around the corner ahead. I nudge my nose behind a big blue building edging the beach road. French plane trees with bark, peeling, patching, uneven spread branches of green and yellow autumn leaves of the shoreline street, scattered amongst them a few palms. The trees provide ample cover, so I step out from behind the building and creep under one, gripping my hand along the thick bark. The maple leaves of red, yellows, and browns, preparing for the upcoming winter, still provide some shade that feels like a protection. The trees seem to possess a strength I lack. Perhaps it's because they stand rooted to the spot despite winds and thunderstorms. Devier stands at the end of the row of trees by a pastel yellow triple-story building, yelling to someone inside through the open door. His cart rests in front of the building. Dad's cap is still lying on the rug. Cheval, Devier calls into the building entrance. Cheval pops his head from the doorway, and I falter against the tree. What's he doing with talking with Devier? A moment, Devier, Laverne, my loyal man, Cheval says. I just arrived, had to harangue a crowd. A jiffy later out steps Chevelle, still in the suit, still appearing like a king, but now holding a crimson cloth covered cage. The same color cloth upon the cage that covered the monkey with the wings. Real alliance to the ship's hold, Chevier tells Devier, pointing to the cart with a the blanket. Then gather more wine and dried fruit. Devier points at the cage. Your creature ready? 
Absolutely. Talbot received him from my quarters in Roquelafort de la Rubadou. And he's not a creature. Cheviau wags a finger at Devier. A creation. A Barbary monkey from the Rock of Gibraltar. People say those monkeys are quite pestering. Cheval dusts his pant leg and says to Devier, I'll meet you on deck after my show. Show? Devier glances at the rumpled rug on the wagon. You think this old Epianian knows how to find the heart? For certain, Cheval says. Devier saying old Epianian indicates that there being a man under that rug. It seems the lumps under the rug are not muskets, but rather a man. A detective man. Has to be! But is he a Banian? They're not trustworthy. What in a ship's hull is he doing under a rug? Sleeping? Is he drunk? A drunk detective sounds about right. Devier and Cheval depart. Devier wheels the squeaky wheeled cart beyond the palms and French plane trees, surely heading for his ship, because Cheval said he was going to meet him later on deck. Cheval takes the rattling crimson cloth covered cage and saunas into the streets. It's intriguing to learn if the creature inside the cage is the monkey with the attached wings, and Cheval performing some show would be a sight to behold to the end of my days. But only one man can be followed. The cage squeaking in Cheval's hands rattles out of view. Let it go, Lincoln. Bigger matters at hand. I set my gaze to Devier in the small cup and follow the trail that leads to the cap, and possibly a chance of talking to that detective. Drunk though, may he be.